Hello, this is John from Blue Cat 3D Printing. Today, I'm at Fiber Chicken Studios at beautiful Tannehill Ironworks Historical State Park in McCullough, Alabama to talk about bobbins. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about 3D printed bobbins. I've got here a couple of rulers with me. And a lot of you have these, these tapes laying around. Don't use these, as these are not very accurate. They're kind of, um, well, they kind of wear over time and not very accurate. And uh, this is a similar idea. So don't use these tapes. And this is a just a simple ruler. I picked this one up at Dollar General. It cost me 50 cents. It was in the school section. Um, your kids probably have one. These are pretty good. They work really well. And uh, this is a, a very expensive one that I got on Amazon. It cost me 10 bucks. And uh, it's a really, it's a great ruler. I love this one. I use it all the time. And this, of course, is the absolute best thing in the world to measure bobbins with. It's a caliper, and not a lot of people have these. If you do have one of these, they're great. And uh, if you don't have one, I highly recommend getting one. I use this thing all the time. The way that this thing works is pretty straightforward. There's a couple of parts to it. The larger jaws here, these are for measuring outside things. Smaller ones on the top here are made using for um, inside things. And uh, there's a little thing that pops out the end here, and a lot of people don't know what this is about, but this is for measuring depth, if you want to measure how deep something is. So, and the way that you would measure a bobbin with one of these is really easy. Uh, you would just take your bobbin, and this one goes to a Louis Victoria, and uh, spread the thing apart, put it on the end, just like that, and it will give you a readout there, and in this case it's 74 millimeters. And you would do the same thing on the opposite end, you get the measurement on the opposite end the same exact way. Um, you want to be sure and get it so that it's in the center. Not cooperating with, there we go. Just like that. All right, to get the overall length here, you do exactly the same way. You position it at the top and at the bottom like that. And that will give you the overall length. So those are the main three things that you need is you need to know what the dimensions are for each end and the total length. The other thing that I need to know is the center hole here. I need to know how big that center hole is. So to do that, you'll use the smaller section here. You'll just put it in there like that and turn the dial until you get a measurement. All right, so that's, that's pretty much how you would measure a bobbin like this. Now, if you have an antique bobbin, and this is the only antique bobbin that I actually have with me, and this one is damaged, but I'm going to just kind of go show how to measure it. These guys have a lot more parts to them, so I should have turned it this way. Let's do it this way. And so you'll need to know the small end, a diameter of the small end, so just like that. You'll need to know the diameter of the larger end here, so you'll measure that one. Then you'll know you'll want to know the diameter of the whorl, and I'm just kind of guessing based on the wear patterns on this one. But if you, hopefully you have one that's not too badly worn, so you get the measurement for the whorl, and then you'll need to know the distance from here to there, the width of this end. And the, it's kind of important that you get this one right. So. Those are the main measurements you'll need, and of course, just like the uh, previous one, you'll need to know the size of the hole. So that's an important thing too. Now, don't don't worry too much about this. I have all of this stuff outlined on my website, so that's that's all available. Okay, I've talked a little bit about measurements. I want to talk a little bit about units. A lot of people have rulers that have both inches and millimeters on it. I prefer to use the millimeters because it's easier, there's no messy fractions to learn, and there's there's like no no conversions or anything necessary. Whereas the inches you have you have um, the fractions to deal with. And they can be really confusing for a lot of people because you know each one of those little lines represents a different fraction and that's kind of confusing. Um, with millimeters, every little tick mark on this ruler represents one millimeter. So when you see the, the numbers that are on here, those are representing centimeters, which is only which is 10 millimeters. So when you see the, the 10 mark down here, that means 100 millimeters. 
you just add an extra zero to the number. Real simple. Um, okay, I did not mention this one. This is an architect's ruler, and don't use one of these. These are really confusing if you're if you're not you know familiar with the units that are that these are measuring. Really confusing. Don't use one of these. If you're using one of these, the trick is you want to use. Of course, you want to use the millimeter side. More accurate that way. And you'll want to put this up against it so that you can see the the zero line there lines up with the end. And then you'll measure all the way down down here. Right, you want to measure it all the way to right there at the very end. And that's the number you're looking for. Now, again, measuring the diameter of these things, you'll want to take this and you'll want to kind of position it so that the zero line here is on the edge of your bobbin. And then you'll just kind of want to swivel this thing just a little bit up and down, looking at this end here for the largest value. So we're looking right there and it's it's about 55 millimeters. Now it's not it doesn't have to be completely accurate. If you're one or two millimeters off, this is still going to work. Not going to be that big a deal. So that's not critical. The most critical part of this is the inside hole here. You want to make sure you get a good accurate number on that. Um, and the total length from end to end. You want to make sure that that's accurate as possible. And again, even if you're one or two millimeters too short this direction, then it's going, you know, your bobbin is going to kind of move a little bit on the flyer when it's running. And if you're too long, it won't go on at all. So you want to get this, this distance here pretty close. Um, if the center holes, if the center hole of your printed bobbin is not is not uh, is too small you can actually make these things a little bit larger by taking a tool of some kind of knife or a drill bit or screwdriver and run it in there and kind of twist it around a little bit you can actually make these things larger uh, you can go up you can go up a little bit on these if they're too small and, and they don't fit well um, obviously if they're too big then it's a problem with uh, with the antique bobbins if the antique bobbins like these happen to be too long uh, in this direction, you can actually, because this is a triangle here, you can actually use sandpaper and you can sand it down and you can actually make them sh shorter by a very small amount with just a piece of sandpaper on this end. Yeah. Okay, so just want to show a couple of bobbins here. This one goes to, uh, goes to a spinolution, 8 ounce. Uh, this is a Shat bobbin. I've got a couple of other shat bobbins here. This is a, an Ashford uh, single drive. Now this one goes to a Lue S10. So here's a bobbin from an Electric Eel e spinner. And if we were, if I were to make one for an Electric Eel, which I probably could, I haven't done this one, but I could. I would need to know the measurement of each end. So there's one end. And this end here appears to be the same. So I need that end. Then I would need to know what the size of this whirl is on the end here. So you would need to get a measurement on that one. And then of course the overall length here. And then the inside of So once I got all of that information, I can actually put all that stuff into my computer and I can build a bobbin for it. So basically that's kind of how the process works. I take the information about you know, the sizing and then I put it into a software program that I, I wrote myself. And then I run it and it generates the code that, that I sent to the printer to produce one of these. The, these things are put together. See, one of these are, some of these are not glued. This one's not glued. And essentially, it comes off of the printer, just like this, two pieces. And then I take the two pieces off, off the printer, and then I attach it to a piece of uh, PVC pipe, just like this. And uh, then I glue it together, 
and you have a finished bobbin. It's pretty straightforward. Most of my bobbins have a lotus pattern to it, and you can see the, the lotus pattern, this one and, and this one. This is kind of my signature pattern. Most of my bobbins will have this, this same, the same design. And um, the ones, uh, my Spinolution bobbins do not have it. They still have my older design, but they will eventually get the, the Lotus design. It's just a matter of time. So this is a roll of filament. This one is almost empty. I just brought it to kind of show. This is what the bobbins are actually made of. This is the raw material that goes into the machine. So anyway, it goes into the printer like this. And uh, this gets heated up, and then it gets run through an extruder at high temperature, and uh, and it turns into one of these. So, anyway, this is just what it looks like when it comes off. And I buy this material in a roll, just like this. Of course, the roll will be full when I get it. And uh, I have, I think I've got about eight or nine colors now. And there's there's tons of colors available online that I can order. So that's any make pretty much any color. And uh, here's a draw spindle that I made. I don't sell these on my website, at least not right now anyway. They're really good. Now, there's a lot of people selling 3D printed draw spindles. It's not you know, all that unique, but um, these are pretty good. In order to get the weight on these things, because plastic doesn't weigh a lot, I increase the density to a pretty high number, and I usually go about 95%. So. This is, it's not completely solid, it's about 95% solid, which gives it a good bit of weight. So, it makes them work really well. That's all I've got to say. I appreciate your time watching this, and uh, happy spinning.